If you clicked on this video, I just wanted to say thank you and subscribe for some more Red Dead content. This is not stuff that I normally upload, and for some provided context, this series or these types of videos are basically just compilations of videos that are already up on the channel. Just making it easier for people to binge watch everything when it comes to character analysis or breakdowns or deeper looks at relationships from one character to another. Just to make it all easier and more digestible and to combine the individual videos as more of a complete series as a long form video. So that way you could just put on the background, go to sleep, you know, go to work, do whatever you need to do. This one here is all about Micah and Dutch, the two attributed to the downfall of the notorious Dutch Vanderlyn gang. The video covers Dutch's manipulation throughout the game, questioning if he ever truly looked out for the gang members or really just used them for his own benefit, if the death of Micah and John's hand in that actually led to John's family being captured and being held captive by the US government leading into the first game, and a similar token to that, we take a look on if Dutch killing Micah was his way of avenging Arthur. So it more so covers the latter stages of their relationship or partnership, if you can call it that. Now, like usual, there's links to the respective videos and, of course, chapters if you want to jump around. But I'm going to shut the hell up. Enjoy. If I could throw myself in the ground in their stead, I'd do it. Left. What really went down back there on that boat? We miss you. That's what happened. Dutch killed a girl in a bad way. But it was a bad situation. I think I, I mean, we, gonna be okay. You ain't much of anything more than a killer, Mr. Vandalin. This ain't about revenge, Jose. Angela Bronte don't mean shit to me. I just need somebody to buy me some goddamn time. You keep killing folk, Dutch. Parson, do you have my better? Dutch Vanderlyn, charismatic leader, loving father, idealist. Dutch is not a villain. Dutch is not an antagonist either, exactly. There's never any moments within the story of Red Dead Redemption 2 that finds him entirely at odds against Arthur or even John. He does leave them both on separate occasions to the fate of being captured or even potentially killed, yet he's never found at the barrel end of Arthur's gun or begging for his life at the mercy of a vengeful John in the epilogue. Dutch may be labeled as crazy and continues to be increasingly labeled mentally unstable and irrational as the story of the Vanderlyn gang goes on, but that doesn't make him the enemy. He is only a threat to everyone's ultimate safety when it comes to the benefit of his own personal gain and salvation. Dutch is not a good guy driven by the need and assurance that the rest of the members under his watch will be taken care of. It's quite possible that was never even a genuine concern of his. I personally don't ever believe he really strove to provide food, warmth, safety, and what is possibly the most important thing in his eyes, a free way of living to those he took in. Dutch is many things, and I think many of us can interpret his actions in different ways. But at the end of the day, he's not the villain of Red Dead Redemption 2, nor is he the hero. Dutch Vanderlyn is nothing more than a master manipulator, a silver-tongued fox who cultivated a following in his own image, a cult of his own magnetic personality that was passionately preached by a band of loyal, trusted followers, a den of murderers and thieves indoctrinated to believe if they follow Dutch's will, a will that involved robbery, murder, and a creed twisted so deeply they can never hope to be able to identify they were the very things they claim not to be, outlaws and enemies of the state, similar to Dutch's own rival, Colm O'Driscoll. Yet very different. Colm and his men kill for the pleasure of just being a mindless degenerate. Dutch and his band of followers fight to live free, killing and robbing only those who can afford it, offering the plunder to those less fortunate. To these talented gunslingers, they were never fighting for the sake of fighting, but rather they were fighting for a world that is quickly fading away, a world that is slowly suffocating them. From their perspective, what they were, what they were fighting for, and the man who led them all became romanticized. Dutch was seen as a modern-day Robin Hood, a figure of mythic proportion, the only one who can still lead lost souls to safety. He's a man with a plan. And today we're going to be taking a look into the mind and personality that is Dutch Vanderlyn, trusted adopted father, 
kind-hearted leader, selfish and vengeful killer. Many place the blame of his unraveling mind and constantly loosening grip of reality on Micah, a yes-man who cared for little outside of satisfying his own needs to survive. Micah time and again displays a lack of consideration towards the outcome of his actions, especially if it comes at the cost of the gang's well-being, and he's often the scapegoat. He's only been riding with the gang for a short period of time at the onset of Red Dead Redemption 2's story after all, and many cite him as a factor in the Dutch that we get at the end of the game. A man dedicated to making as much quote unquote noise as possible, in an effort to successfully pull off one final grand robbery, and then escapes the virgin lands he has talked so highly of throughout the game. Others cite the death of Hosea. Besides Dutch himself, Hosea is the oldest member in the gang, followed only by Arthur. It's with Micah chipping away at Dutch's conscience, Hosea being publicly executed, all compounded by the symptoms of an untreated head injury, people claim it's not a singular cause of why Dutch is very different at the end of the game but rather specific critical blows that he would never be able to really recover from. However, I don't even think that's entirely true, as we'll see. I don't think Micah's entirely to blame. The only blame I believe Micah can receive is catering to the madness that always lies just below Dutch's surface. All Dutch ever needed was assurance and validation that his way of living, his creed, his will, and what he saw fit was true. And there's nothing wrong with taking what's yours in a world so unjust. I don't think Dutch's head injury really plays that much of a significant role in his decline either. If there was any one thing, it would be the absence of Hosea's rationale, something that's so desperately needed during the chapter of Beaver Hollow, but even with Hosea gone, that would not explain the senseless or outright willingness to kill people in cold blood. The ultimate betrayal of his own law on those that follow him. The law that is meant to separate himself and his group from the rest of the outlaws that roam the lands of the West. While there are many debates and points of view on when, how, or why Dutch fell into the perceived madness he descended into at the end of Red Dead Redemption 2, and it is an undoubtedly drastically different Dutch. One, that outright kills Leviticus Cornwall in broad daylight under a heavy security and armed presence in the town of Annisburg after offering him a deal that he knew Cornwall would never even consider, let alone take. Dutch then launches assaults in the US military either directly or indirectly involved. He lights a fire in the belly of eagle flies and all the younger natives encouraging them to push and fight back against the US military by any means necessary. And then Dutch even decides to hit a train with gold mints for the United States military on top of blowing bridges. There's no doubt these are all actions he most likely would never give a second thought at the beginning of the game. Whether if we want to attribute that to the Council of Hosea, the overall state of the Vanderland gang, and the fact the members collectively didn't have to deal with the tragedy and hardship after hardship as they had to deal with as the game progressed. They had no choice but to endure. The deaths of Hosea, Lenny, Sean, losing, gold, being made fools of by Angelo Bronte, which in turn led to depleted morale, added outside pressure, and with it increasing question and curiosity with what the hell is truly going on. I don't doubt the events of the game impact the Dutch's psyche. I don't doubt every unfortunate event resulted in some sort of doubt, some sort of question in Dutch's leadership, in Dutch's planning, in Dutch's priorities. Was it really him or the rest of the gang he was looking after? Had things changed, or was this always the case? Dutch Vanderlyn Finishing School has some strange graduates. That it does. To your good health. Thank you. For when to get a quick glimpse of Dutch's true character, you don't need to look any further than the first two chapters of the game. While not yet blatantly in your face, Dutch has already shown indirectly the character that lies just beneath the surface. In the opening mission alone, we get to see the charismatic leader he is and the flair for public speaking that he has. We are going to ride out. And we're gonna find some food. Everybody, we're safe now. There ain't nobody following us through a storm like this one. And by the time they get here, well, we're gonna be, we're gonna be long gone. We've been through worse than this before. Now all of you, all of you, get yourselves warm. Stay strong stay with me we ain't done yet an ability to rally the people his people behind him to have the utmost faith 
and trust in him. For he, now more than ever before, needs all of them. And none of them can hope to survive without trusting and relying on each other. The gang is on the run deep into the mountains, facing a terrible blizzard head on, desperate to escape the law that's hot on their trail. Dutch being the head of the group should take blame for the unfortunate position they all find themselves in. Besides damn near freezing to death, the gang has suffered some casualties as well, resulting in a few people killed and at least two to three people missing if we were to count John. That's also not taken into account that Dutch committed a senseless killing in the heat of a robbery. A robbery which Arthur and Hosea didn't feel too confident in, betting their money on a real estate scam. Nonetheless, beginning with the events in Blackwater, as many of us know, and as we heard from Javier Suela during this video's introduction, Dutch killed an innocent girl during the ferry boat robbery back in Blackwater, and according to Javier's description, she was killed in a quote-unquote bad way. So, you were there, Javier. What really happened on that boat? We had the money, it seemed fine. Then suddenly they were everywhere. Bounty hunters? No, Pinkerton's. It was crazy. Raining bullets. Dutch killed a girl in a bad way. But it was a bad situation. That ain't like him, though. Javier then continues to dismiss the severity of Dutch's decision to take this poor girl's life by stating it was a quote-unquote bad situation. I always found that statement interesting because it comes off as Javier attempting to rationalize Dutch's actions, diminishing the transgression of Dutch killing this poor, innocent girl. And on top of it, the gruesome details later recounted by people who had experienced the execution, such as John, who during the chapter of Shady Bell, has some in-game dialogue opening up about how he quote-unquote can't get the image of her death out of his head, and he's starting to doubt Dutch's leadership. But really, it's the account from the strange man in Red Dead Redemption that gives us the best details pertaining to her death. Do you remember Hattie McCourt's face? Who? She was a girl Dutch Vanderlyn shot in the head on that raid on the ferry a few years back. Same one you got shot on. Pretty girl, until her eye was hanging out by a thread of tendon and her brain was plastered over a wall. This interaction gives us a name, Heidi McCourt, and it gives us the details of the brutality surrounding her death at the hands of Dutch. Frankly, it's no wonder John was traumatized and Javier described it as a bad way. Even Dutch had to acknowledge it was horrible to himself or that he fucked up spectacularly because when directly confronted by Arthur about what exactly happened, Dutch just responds with, Hey, I ain't had time to ask. Me. What really went down back there on that boat? We missed you. That's what happened. Come on. Obviously, hindsight is 2020, and we don't know it yet, but the pattern for Dutch's behavior, that is later identified as reckless, is already starting to take shape. Dutch has killed someone. Members loyal to him question the action, but don't start to challenge him, what he's doing, or even question the state of mind he's in. Certain things change with this event, because it's mainly attributed to the maniac that is Micah, who's been nothing but trouble for the gang since his recruitment. Blackwater's almost entirely blamed on him, but even Micah didn't have that much control over Dutch. Not to the point of having Dutch willingly break his own creed, his own rule of killing folk in cold blood. It's evident through Dutch's utter contempt towards the civilized world's growing power and with it the increased support for universal law, that he has an issue with following orders or submitting to another person's will. Many people have already established time and again Dutch is a severe narcissist. He thinks so highly of himself and his mission that men such as Cornwall, Bronte, and Milton deserve nothing short of death for condemning a man of such high stature for the people as he is. What is not really emphasized as much is how his refusal to submit to others doesn't apply exclusively to those outside of his own ranks. Dutch is often discussing with Hosea why he is right and why Hosea should side with him. We don't need to take revenge. We hardly know the guy. This ain't about revenge, Hosea. Angelo Bronte don't mean shit to me. This is about the fact we are planning to rob a bank in his town. A bank that he no doubt protects. A town where his men are gunning for us. Jose is the only person ever allowed to rationalize with Dutch. Even Arthur in the later events of the game can't get through to him. He's someone who once his mind is made up, nothing's going to change it. You're either with him or against him. 
Nika chose to side with him. However, going along with someone can't be mistaken for convincing or pushing someone into doing something that's contradictory to their own morals, values, or ways of behaving. And if we were to go a little bit further and take a look at Arthur's journal, we can see what was going on with Dutch and everyone around him after the trolley station job, a particular situation that's often cited as one of the main breaking points for Dutch, with him always ranting and raving at how Bronte tricked and betrayed him, playing him and the gang for a fool. Dutch was so unnerved and upset about it that no one even thought of entertaining the idea of sparing Bronte or even mentioning Bronte at all to Dutch. Not even Micah. Arthur outright directly says in his journal, Dutch is raging about Bronte's deception or betrayal or whatever quite it was. Dutch don't like being made a fool of. Even Micah with all his teasing and nettling plays it real cool with Dutch. This, I believe, further supports what I was saying about Dutch refusing to submit to another's will. Micah was nothing more than a yes-man and a scapegoat for the gang's woes. Woes that ultimately was attributed to Dutch's own poor decision-making. That, in turn, was falsely placed on Micah, who was well aware he could not force Dutch into doing or acting any more than Hosea could. By Arthur mentioning that Micah was unwilling to even approach Dutch about the topic of Bronte shows just who was really in control there between Dutch and Micah. I just wanted to point that out because I feel Micah's role in Dutch's decline is always mistaken. I'm not arguing Micah definitely didn't help and encourage Dutch to make all the wrong choices. However, by placing the blame on Micah and saying that he is the cause of all of it couldn't be further from the truth. Dutch was always primed, ready, and willing to take lives. At the end of the day, after all, he is an outlaw. And as many of the members have said before, how do you rob and kill others pleasantly? Despite Dutch's talk, they don't. It doesn't take much to cross the threshold from looking at someone as an obstacle in the gang's path that should be and will be eliminated no matter what, even if that meant taking their life. Looking at someone that without a doubt is standing in their way, such as the Pinkertons or the Adriscolls or even Bronte, to then turn the aggression onto civilians and justify it as something that needed to happen in order for the gang to survive is exactly what Dutch ended up doing. What was that? Horrible old crone. But you killed her. She was gonna betray us, Arthur. Couldn't you tell? No. Well, I got some Spanish. She was. You keep killing folk, Dutch. I am just trying to make sure that some of us survive, Arthur. It took time for him to finally address the murder of Heidi McCourt, but when he did, he says it was necessary for the gang's survival. The same sentiment he echoed when confronted by someone with what is going on or with what Dutch is doing. Dutch, time and again, attempts to rationalize his actions by stating it's necessary for the gang's survival. I don't know. Well, I do. It ain't nice. I know it. But it is us or him. I figure it might as well be him. He uses the same excuse with Heidi's death. He does the same thing with the brutal drowning of Angelo Bronte and the latest shooting of Leviticus Cornwall. These are all people that will not let the gang survive or leave them be. So long as they draw breath, they are a threat and need to be eliminated, or so Dutch claims. Arguably due to his own power and immense resources, Leviticus Cornwall was the only person who could touch Dutch and the rest of the gang no matter where they went. Bronte, on the other hand, while he may have posed an immediate threat so long as the gang stayed close to or, or continued to run operations within the city of Saint Denis, yes, Bronte would be a threat. Would he be such a threat as to really make his death necessary before the robbery of the Saint Denis bank? Ultimately, I think the bank of Saint Denis could have been hit even if Bronte was allowed to live. It may have taken some additional planning or even required time to be sacrificed in order for it to all work out, but it could still have been managed. Bronte himself was a very arrogant man and considered Dutch a dirty hillbilly, surprised at his own ability to just clothe himself. Dutch played dumb and even submitted to Bronte once before in his mansion upon the first time they met. We are simple country folk. All we have is each other. And you have gone and you have took his son and that which we weren't innocent of, well, we, we most surely were ignorant of. Dutch could have definitely feigned ignorance or found some way to play into Bronte's sense of superiority, letting the man to live, avoiding killing him, and even making a bad situation a whole lot worse. However, he let his emotions get the best of him. Giving in so passionately to his emotions, he made no reservations about insulting and even taunting Bronte while he brutally drowned him. 
going so far as finishing Bronte's killing by humiliating him even further, by eliminating his very existence of ever living on this planet and feeding him to alligators. This brutal demonstration of Dutch's high ego and perception of himself, leaving nothing left of the man whose biggest mistake was playing Dutch for an idiot. Dutch, I would argue, has always allowed his emotions to really dictate his or rather the gang's next course of action to some degree. Bronte's death is undeniably unique given the brutality and lack of control Dutch has usually seen to have. This is the only time he has ever committed something so heinously by his own hands and the intensity of which is unprecedented. And it far betrays his original claim of Bronte's death being a necessary step in order for the bank robbery of Saint-Denis to ever hope to be a success. Whether if that statement was really true or not, what is undeniable is Dutch's own hatred towards this man. This was a murder that had a strong personal element to it. And when that element was scrutinized, Dutch implied the person questioning his decision was a traitor, as seen during the drowning of Bronte and the strangulation of the old lady's death on Guarma. The question here I want to present to all of you is, is the Vanderlyn gang all about being for the people, or do the people under his leadership represent the entity that is Dutch Vanderlyn? Start dancing? Looks like I turned into a goddamn errand boy. You have turned into my son. You worry because I worry. We are just the same. Horseshoe Overlook introduces the game's ledger, a feature of the game that allows the player to reinvest into the camp and to a degree, its members. If we were to look at this as a key factor of the game's lore, not just an extra thing to invest your time and resources in from strictly gameplay perspective, then it provides some extra insight into Dutch's mentality and the culture within the gang's hierarchy. Dutch immediately after escaping the freezing cold of the mountains can be seen often lounging around the camp, smoking a cigar, donning on extravagant clothing, and even occasionally breaking out into an impromptu speech on how he and the rest of the gang need each other, motivating them to work harder. Besides his clothes and really not doing much, Dutch has the biggest and most private living space, complete with his own phonograph or gramophone, and his tent is one of the earliest upgrades you can invest in within the ledger. On the one hand, his lack of being hands-on is excusable. After all, it seems most members already have the, I trust Dutch and if I can do it, why leave it up to him to do the heavier lifting mentality? I'll do the hard work and he'll see us through. Regardless of what his plan is, we'll all be okay. This mindset proved highly beneficial for Dutch. It prevented him from descending to the level of others, sparing him the need to engage in unsavory tasks as those around him were much more willing to handle such matters on his behalf. This solidified his standing as a figure akin to a deity, a man set apart from the rest. Even when he did make a mistake, as he did back in Blackwater, it was much more palatable for others to believe that Dutch didn't intentionally make the decision himself. Instead, they found it easier and much more reassuring to think of him seeking counsel and acting on behalf of another, in Blackwater's case that being Micah, because acknowledging the mistake that it was actually of Dutch's design fractured the idolized image of him, and along with it the unwavering faith they all had in him and his overall message. Better to find flaws in other humans rather than this mythic Robin Hood. Regarded as a morally upright individual in a world lacking such virtue, Dutch managed to keep his hands clean of any unsavory tasks. This in turn allowed him to skillfully manipulate that same exact perception, gradually convincing everyone that he prioritized their well-being above all else. However, Hosea consistently urged consideration for the gang's overall situation, cautioning that certain actions could lead to more harm and fatalities. As seen in the initial train heist targeting Leviticus Cornwall as it departed the Grizzly Mountains and later again during Dutch's deliberation on preparing for an assault on Angela Bronte's mansion. I just don't want any more folks to die, Dutch. We're living, Hosea, we're living. Look at me. We're living. Even you. But we need money. Everything we have is in Blackwater. You fancy heading back there? No. Listen, Dutch, I ain't trying to undermine you. I just... Dutch, however, responded to these expressions of concern by framing them as doubts in him. From his earliest culture, any form of opposition, even innocent inquiries about what comes next, was construed as doubting his leadership. This perception shift might have been a consequence of time naturally progressing, leading to a belief that he embodied the gang itself, something that's not all too uncommon when someone is constantly within their own head trying to justify their own at least train of thoughts, let alone the consequences that lead to succumbing to those thoughts, but his caprices and even decisions were increasingly viewed as made for the collective good of the gang, even when that wasn't entirely true. The full extent of the truth in this matter may remain elusive, as Dutch's occasional attempts to align with Hosea imply a recognition that he sometimes knew 
he acted based on his own personal desires rather than the gang's collective best interests. The evolution of this perception into Dutch's reality during Hoshiro Overlook is debatable. However, as the game advances, there's an indication of it gaining strength. This is evident during a casual fishing retreat with Jose and Arthur where Dutch initially admits he believes he will be okay, only to then hastily correct himself by saying, we. I think, I, well, I mean, we, are gonna be okay. One can interpret this lapse in two distinct ways. One perspective is that Dutch is very selfish, solely concerned with just his well-being, viewing the gang members merely as tools to fulfill his desires. From this viewpoint, they become expendable pawns, kept compliant by their unwavering belief in Dutch's vision and his perceived capability to turn it into reality, regardless of its apparent impossibility. On the flip side, the alternative perspective is that Dutch embodies the entirety of the gang, mind, body, and spirit. According to this viewpoint, it's his responsibility to guide them all to the untarnished territories of the West, a commitment he fervently made to each member. However, driven by his own narcissism, Dutch assumes the role of the glorified outlaw, a messiah for the lost souls. This entails donning specific attire, dwelling in a tent, more glorious than a rest, and adopting a manner of speech that befits only a savior. Even if Dutch's role as a savior was more theoretical than truthful, delving into the realm of emotions, no one manipulates them quite like Dutch, and among those impacting the most is Arthur. While this dynamic isn't unique to just Arthur, he stands as his primary victim. It happens time and again, but I think one of the more blatant, in-your-face instances is if we go back to Coulter within the first 20 minutes of the game, when Arthur gets his chance to ask Dutch what exactly happened on the ferry boat in Blackwater, Dutch's response is simply, we missed you. On the surface, it's easy to just dismiss this as Dutch believing that an extra gunman, someone as efficient as Arthur definitely would have been extremely helpful and went a long way. However, I think there's more to that statement, especially within Arthur where there's a strong father-son bond here. It's meant to evoke a profound sense of regret. It plants the seed of thought within Arthur of, if I had been there, perhaps this chaos could have been averted. Maybe I could have intervened to prevent things from spiraling out of control or even saved a life or two. The question of whether Dutch truly sees himself as the gang becomes more intricate as the game progresses, especially when you consider how he manipulates motions time and again. Gratitude appears to be the pivotal motion tethering everyone to Dutch. After all, he did rescue them from the perils of abandonment preventing them from being left to fend for themselves or, in some instances, faring even worse with other gangs. To renounce this faith in Dutch is akin to rejecting the man who saved them. As mentioned earlier in this discussion, Dutch isn't inherently a villain. At one point, he might have been an upright individual embodying the principles he preached. However, in the moments leading up to, during, and following the events of Red Dead Redemption 2, he proves not to be the man we initially believed him to be and it becomes an overall complex situation. A situation where in this video, we just look at how the mask slipped and it continued to slip between Dutch's fingers after every single critical blow from the death of Hosea, money being lost, pressures from multiple threats all around him, and then him continually taking things much, much more personally, using the gang and its members as a vessel to achieve the thing that he said the gang never needed to achieve, and that being revenge. We are all bastards, my friend. But only one of us is some would-be emperor's whore. We know who you are. And nobody knows who you are. Not even your goddamn father. You maggots. One of the more intriguing concepts of Red Dead Redemption is how this game deals with the overarching theme of death. How a person comes to grips with their fate knowing their life is on a timer and there's so much they have to do. So much reassurance and not only themselves doing any and everything they can so they can ensure they pass on to the next life as content as they possibly can. Their lives may not be perfect, but at least they can somewhat rest easy knowing they did all they can to improve all the relationships that were important to them, either throughout their life or towards the conclusion of it. To rectify damaged relationships or get something off of their chest that has been on their mind for quite some time. I feel like you should take your woman and child and get lost. Do you? You can, you could give something to Jack. Hey, Stider. Well, I don't see no way out of this. But do it for me. It would make me feel 
Good, if that makes any sense. A little, but... Listen to me. When the time comes, you gotta run and don't look back. This is over. Similar to how we get a boost of energy when we're in danger, we got the perspective of what it's like to panic, grasp at everything you can to save any and everyone you can, doing your very best to get them to listen, flip their situation around before it's too late, before circumstances get worse on them or they don't have your guidance anymore due to your own unfortunate fate. It's an objective that in of itself is relatable. Who here hasn't tried to help someone out before? However, given Arthur's underlying fear of the unknown and his rapidly deteriorating health, we're provided a unique advanced perspective on a state of mind that we will possibly never be put into ourselves. We get to witness Arthur's fear firsthand of what's going to be awaiting him following the moments of choking down his last breath. And it's a fear that's augmented even more due to everyone he still cares about aren't willing or even in the state of mind themselves to help out their own situation. Charles, for the most part, I think is the best one in the best situation considering he moves on with the PD Indians up to a different country, up north into Canada. John is still somewhat in the state of mind where he doesn't exactly know what he wants to do. Arthur has to tell him and promise him that, hey, take this moment and get the hell out of here. None of this matters anymore. It would mean a lot to me. Please. There ain't no more time for talk. Go. Arthur, go to your family. Arthur, get the hell out of here and be a goddamn man. And then of course there's Sadie that's still hell-bent on not only revenge for the rest of the Driscolls, but she's completely devoted the rest of her life to this new lifestyle. She's gone. She's not willing to be domesticated anymore. And despite of everything else going on, Arthur still cares very deeply for Dutch, at least in terms of the good ending. He still pleads with Dutch to look at what he's doing, where he's going, how this is turning out for the entire gang. What's going on with him? I think it's apparent he still quite cares for Dutch in the end, but Arthur is certainly not the only death witnessed throughout the entire game. There's plenty of it, with characters both close to him and those who are on the opposing side of his good graces, but with Arthur being the main protagonist and of course the perspective we are given throughout our journey the main story's narrative, naturally Arthur's death hits the hardest and is the most intimate. I don't think there was a single dry eye when he crawled over to the ledge and we saw him starting to struggle more and more with his breathing as he stared out to the sunrise. Lenny's, Hosea's, and especially John's from the first game, I think, hit almost as hard, but this one definitely takes the cake. Sean's, Miss Grimshaw's, and Molly's were also notable ones, but I think one that gets overshadowed is the death of Micah's. It's for an entirely different reason, though. No, there's no love lost here, no sadness or damn, why did it have to be like this type of feeling? I think it's actually the complete opposite. Our own investment in trying to get this rat bastard, this soulless piece of shit that torments at Arthur throughout the story, and is often blamed for the entire downfall of the Vanderlyn gang. And because of it all and how everything transpired, it's considered responsible for the deaths of Lenny, Hosea, and I mean he outright shot Miss Grimshaw, so there's no speculation there. But it's because of that sigh of relief, that rejoice, that happiness, that we finally got him. We don't realize the final giant middle finger Micah gives us. Technically, his death is the one that caused the events of Red Dead Redemption. Yes, of course, there's no mention of Micah in the original Red Dead Redemption, but I would say Rockstar could have easily used Micah's death similar to how they used Arthur in the first game. They just don't mention it. They could have essentially left the death that Micah had just that. Let everyone be happy at the fact that we finally got the person that betrayed us and we all wanted to kill from almost the very start of the game. But instead, it was because of his corpse found in Mount Hagen by Edgar Ross and Archer Fordham in the game's credits. These are the two agents that hold Abigail and Jack in custody, forcing John to hunt down the previous Vanderlyn gang members in the first game. It's a good chance that they were actually tracking down Micah and instead found someone that managed to do their job 
for them. And if that person was able to take out someone as vicious and as intimidating as Micah Bell himself, well, then it would make sense for the agents to be interested in the exact person responsible for the death of this monster. Micah's death was cleverly used as a narrative device. A final fuck you from beyond the grave. It triggered a series of events that essentially outed John Marston as still being alive and in the area that he may well still have a bounty on in his head. It may not be an active bounty per se, but taking into account John's massive rap sheet and of course, never facing any repercussions of what transpired during the Blackwater Massacre, or let's even say something much sooner, such as escaping from Sisica Penitentiary, resulting in the death of countless lawmen. For those of us that have already played the original Red Dead Redemption, we already know how vengeful and unrelenting Edgar Ross is. It's strange you should say that, Mr. Marston, because according to my files, you are the horse son. Now what else can I recall from the files? Oh, let's see. You killed hundreds of innocent people. You've robbed at least 40 banks that we're aware of. They told us there was a prize when you got to 50. I'm glad this is all such a joke to you. I want my family. And I'm sure all the men you murdered wanted their families too. Come now, you're stupid, but you're not that stupid. So it also begs the question of if Micah truly ever worked with the Pinkertons, just based off the events of the original Red Dead Redemption, there's no redemption. There's no way to make it back from this criminal lifestyle. Edgar Ross refused to let John Marston walk off scot-free. By all accounts, he was a changed man. He did everything the agents demanded of him. He settled down in a ranch with a domesticated life with his wife and son. And still, Edgar Ross was all too willing to launch a full-on assault on John Marston's property. And who knows, he may have well had the intention of killing everybody there. It's much better to ensure there's no witnesses to talk about how corrupt or bloodthirsty this new and improved form of civilization is. John, by all accounts, while some things he did were still questionable, it did look like he was not only capable and willing, but genuinely wanted to change, to settle down and grow old with his wife and son and leave his life of killing and robbing completely in the past, and Edgar Ross was not willing to take that chance, or even let it happen. If the Pinkertons, or Ross is superior, that being Agent Milton actually did work with Micah Bell and was fully aware of this man's nature. And of course, it would make sense that he would come back around and try to tie up this loose end. Whether if Micah did work with the Pickertons or not, it sounds like after the events of the main story of Red Dead Redemption, when Micah went out and formed his own gang, he definitely went off the rails with the brutality being completely cranked up. So either way, Micah had to be stopped. And there is not much of a surprise that there was some type of hell headed his way. In a way, it echoes Dutch's old sentiments. Revenge is a fool's game. By gratifying themselves with avenging the death and memory of Arthur, John was revealed to still be alive. Which by just going based off the discussion between Charles and John when they come into contact again during the mission Bare Knuckle Friendships and Charles is out there in Saint Denis throwing fist fights, they both thought each other were dead. It sounds like everybody believed everybody was dead and they all just decided to go their separate ways, at least as far as the enforcers go. That being Sadie, John, Charles, and actually even Uncle. The woman did too, but they more or less kept in contact, that being Mary Beth and Tilly. Anyways, unfortunately we don't know if killing Micah lets anything tying back to Charles and Sadie who left the entire region, but for at least John. If it wasn't for him going after Micah, he may very well have lived well into his old age, to pass away peacefully at his ranch and possibly even see grandkids and Jack altogether would have avoided the life that he got sucked into that his parents tried so hard to keep him out of. It's a series of events that ultimately could have been avoided if John would have even listened to Abigail who pleaded and begged to just leave it all in the past. It's a combination and mixture of multiple things and in the end it leads back to just Micah being a piece of shit. But let me know what you think. Do you think that if John decided to let it be, Charles and Sadie would have still went forward with trying to take out Micah themselves? Would that have resulted in a three-way fight between whatever agents came with Archer and Ross caught in the middle of this fight between Charles, Sadie, Micah, and his men? Or do you think they would have left it all in the past, not worry about it, and eventually Micah would have been caught up too by the law? Who knows, maybe even Dutch would have been caught in some crossfire between Micah, his men, and the agents that are pursuing after Micah and his gang. But let me know what you think down in the comment section below. I thought this was pretty interesting, or at least an interesting take, because when you go back and even just look at the credits or the concept of revenge and as I said at the beginning of the video death itself Micah's death is significant because it almost directly leads into the first game
Death is by no means rare or uncommon throughout our time with Red Dead Redemption 2's story. From main characters or core members of the Vanderlyn gang, other members of various gangs or warriors within the Wapiti Native American tribe. It's something that surrounds us. It's an inherent part of that time in history as well as an outcome that simply is unavoidable due to Arthur and the Vanderlyn gang's own activities. Or is it? While some deaths within the story are inevitable, such as the death of Thomas Downs, a man who was terminally ill with tuberculosis. To people that, whether it was right or wrong, they pushed the gang to its limits and as such the price to pay was their life. This was the case of, well, the entire Braithwaite and Gray family lineage to even Agent Milton himself. If things were handled differently or less a sense to teach a lesson, to get even, and to pay the gang back, these two families and even Milton himself may have continued to live a long and maybe relatively uneventful life in peace. Some events and elements within the game would need to be rewritten or changed in some kind of noticeable or dramatic way for the outcomes of these three to be different. However, there are two deaths within the story that have always been a major question of, did they really have to die? Could the gang have actually escaped this life and live in relative obscurity had it not been for one simple fact? Dutch's need to feel superior. His need that continued to grow in size to teach a lesson, a lesson that he would not be made a fool of. And anyone who dares to show otherwise will be taunted and dragged through the mud. He will show them the hell that there is to pay for making a fool of this Robin Hood type of messiah. Those two deaths are Angelo Bronte and Leviticus Cornwall. There are two major obstacles that the Vanderlyn gang has to deal with for very different reasons that may stem from the same origin, that being the gang getting involved with the business ventures of these two powerful men. The nuances from person to person may be different, but the circumstances and grand question is the same. Did the gang really have no choice in killing one, if not both of these men? To really give this a fair shake, let's dive into how the gang and these men came to cross paths. If there was ever an out or better way, or if the outcome that we ultimately have in the end was really all they could do. Let's begin this with the easier of the two, Angelo Bronte. You had nothing to do with destroying the liquor business! We was innocent bystanders. And that which we weren't innocent of, well, we we most surely were ignorant of. Bronte was a little different in the sense of him losing money on account of his business ties to the illegal moonshine operation in the swamps out in the state of Lemoyne. So he was more of an indirect casualty. This was due to Dutch and the gang's plan to ingratiate themselves with the local populace of Rhodes, that being the Gray family in this particular case. The gang lent a hand in completely decimating their rivals, the Braithwaite's moonshining operation, indirectly affecting Angelo Bronte's bottom line. This results in him later accepting to kidnap Jack Marston as a form of compensation for what the Vanderlyn gang had costed him by destroying his moonshine ventures. Upon coming to Jack's rescue, it appeared blood was about to be shed and lives were going to come at the cost of an unfortunate misunderstanding. A misunderstanding that appeared to be forgiven with Jack's safe return into the gang's custody so long as some local grave robbers were dealt with on Bronte's behalf. So, uh, can my friend have his son? Of course, of course. <laughs> but, uh, should I be out of pocket over a misunderstanding? Of course I know you would not want that, huh? No. No, no, no. So, how about this? You perform a simple job for me, and you get your son back. So began an uneasy, let's call it truce, as Bronte never clearly considered Dutch or his gang of any major use, or I, I should really say, a threat. As a matter of fact, it was more so the complete opposite, offending Dutch any chance he got both in English and Italian. Perhaps never even properly forgiven Dutch for his hand in the moonshine business tanking, or maybe making it harder as he no longer could go through the Braithwaite's. I personally think due to Bronte's own sense of superiority and arrogance that wasn't completely unwarranted since he had the entire city of saint in his pocket from the highest city officials down to the police chief. I believe Bronte saw the Vanderlyn gang as just another organization he could use to his benefit. Another disposable group that was only allowed to walk into the city of saint -Denis because of Bronte's mercy and possible use out of them. When he realized during the party at the mayor's mansion that the gang wasn't that easy to control though, that's when he decided it was in his best interest to just get rid of them, possibly even make an example out of them. That is Hector Fellows, mm. this self-righteous newspaper man. 
Maybe, maybe you will kill him for me one day. <laughs> well, we're not paid killers as such, not in cold blood anyway. I did not know you were so particular that uh, you wouldn't help a friend. Oh, I'm willing to help in any way I can, uh, within reason. <laughs> I'm going to pretend to understand what that means. I meant no offense, sir. I'm not taken. None taken! <laughs> <laughs> so came to fruition the proposition of looking into the trolley station for some cash should Dutch need it, knowing it was a location where little cash could be seized and a swift police response could be counted on, removing any need to have a constant large police force around a target that could have been more financially damaging to any more ventures Bronte could have had his hand in, in and around the city of Saint Denis. As most of us know, Dutch eventually realized the trap Bronte tricked him into, leading to a major factor in Bronte's death, which was Dutch could not stand being taken for a fool, and so has a personal vendetta against Bronte. This is something Hosea calls out Dutch for when he initially proposed killing Bronte, masking it not as a form of revenge, but as a necessary act. He knows the type of man Angelo Bronte is, and if the gang wanted to hit the Bank of Saint Denis to secure the funds they need in order to just disappear, Bronte has to go first. A deal with business the right way. We don't need to take revenge. We hardly know the guy. This ain't about revenge, Hosea. Angelo Bronte don't mean shit to me. This is about the fact we are planning to rob a bank in his town. A bank that he no doubt protects. A town where his men are gunning for us. Now, technically speaking, the gang could have just disappeared and completely removed itself out of the city of Saint Denis, but they chose not to. And with Hosea being an active part in the planning of the bank robbery of Saint Denis, I would say that's justification insane that to some degree Dutch is not the only one to blame here. If the topic or the conversation went in the direction of just dropping everything and disappearing or leaving the area or completely abandoning everything in Saint Denis, that would be a different story. But I personally don't recall any moment where Arthur, Hosea or anybody else said, hey, let's just leave. And that's an important factor because if it wasn't for the continued planning or objective of hitting the Saint Denis bank, then Angelo Bronte would have just disappeared into obscurity. It would have just been ideal for them to just stay out of the city altogether. That is Bronte's domain. So long as they stay away from the city, then it may be a safe bet to say he could have been left alone. Yes, he's arrogant and a powerful man, but considering the low regard he had for Dutch and their personal interactions and he would technically have the last laugh after the failed trolley station job, there would be no need for Bronte or Dutch to go after one another. Unless Dutch or any other gang member for that matter decided to continue to interrupt Bronte's dealings, I don't see Bronte going out of his way to pursue the Vanderlyn gang. But as the option to just leave the Saint Denis bank robbery alone or Saint Denis altogether was never an option, did Bronte's death still have to happen in order for the bank to be hit? The sad thing is, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think Bronte's death really made that much of a difference, at least on the surface. We don't know the exact details of how Bronte's death really played out within the politics and the overall dealings of Saint Denis. The Vanderlyn gang straight up storming his mansion by no means was a small or quiet affair, but who's to say whether if that really put the entire city on high alert? We have a high profile brazen assault on one of the city's wealthiest citizens. Whether if it was known by every single person or just by a select few behind closed doors and that he had the city officials and the police chief in his pocket or not is hard to say. And on the same side of that coin, the reason why it's so important to at least take into consideration is because it leads to either the city taking a collective sigh of relief now that Bronte is removed or there's heightened security within the city with some city officials, possibly even the police chief, now having a personal vendetta with their pockets being lighter. Bronte's death, or at least overall disappearance, may well have played a part in the Pinkertons and Agent Milton arriving in Saint Denis as well, with Milton possibly having some type of suspicion that was only confirmed with the mayhem and destruction that was left at Bronte's mansion. It wouldn't be too difficult to spot someone like Dutch who, not too long ago, launched a very brazen assault on the trolley station. Milton is also not exactly unfamiliar with the gang and how they operate. There's no proof on how the Pickertons came to know the Vanderlyn gang had their sights on the Saint Denis bank, or that Jose and Abigail was meant to be the distraction for the main target. Bronte's disappearance may have pointed them in the right direction, only with the knowledge he's accumulated over however long he's been pursuing them, to put the pieces together and just wait for the gang to fall into his hands. 
which they inevitably did. I'd also be failing a crucial part of this argument if I didn't mention one other major thing, Dutch's feelings towards Bronte. From the rather personal drowning to the curiously and suspiciously logical argument that Bronte had to go in order for the gang's future to be secured, Dutch hating Bronte and feeling a certain way arguably was up to speculation until we dive into Arthur's journal, where Arthur details Dutch's own sensitivity to Bronte in wake of the trolley station job. Bronte's name alone was enough to set Dutch over the edge. He became so passionate with rage that Arthur writes that even Micah was wary of mentioning Bronte to him. It could be a collective error that befell the entire gang by just not packing up and leaving, but it really was Dutch that allowed his emotions to make two vital errors that arguably was not only unnecessary but caused the death of his longtime best friend Hosea, the young life of Lenny, and the freedom of John Marston. The first one was snuffing out the life of Angelo Bronte. The second one was continuing on with the bank robbery of Saint Denis. No matter what, it probably would have been a very bad idea to steal at the bank job, whether if Bronte was or wasn't alive, but they probably could have ran the gambit and left Bronte be for them to just focus on the Saint Denis bank robbery. Or they could have ran a distraction that would have feigned an attack on Angelo Bronte's mansion, making it appear that there was gonna be some sort of revenge which then would have caused law enforcement and Bronte's own men to be tied up at that mansion. And with the assault and his disappearance not going days before the Saint Denis bank robbery that may have played everything out differently, the Pinkertons and the amount of men and firepower they arrived in Saint Denis with may not have been a factor. But ultimately, Bronte didn't have to die. The Saint Denis bank didn't have to be hit. And if Dutch listened, just bit his tongue and moved on, Hosea may well have lived a little longer. But what do you think? Do you think Bronte had to go? Do you think there was any alternative to the Saint Denis Bank where everyone just kind of had their sights set on it and it was set in stone? Let me know what you think. My name is Leviticus Cornwall. I am not a man to be messed with by the likes of you. Get out here before I have these men killed. What do you think? Get out here, well, I... you depraved piece of trash! You start spinning the yarn, and when I think the moment's you right, I'll make a I move. You think I got where I am by letting Skywalk you rob from me? Vandalin, you're done! Now get out here now! Deal with this nonsense! Leviticus Cornwall, I'd actually argue, had to go either way. The debatable part, I think, comes with how he was dealt with. I don't think Dutch handled it intelligently, and it was yet another rash decision on the whim. But to put it plainly, Cornwall wasn't isolated to a region such as Bronte was. In the greater state of Lemoyne or up in the forest of Roanoke Ridge, Bronte was nothing, just a thought. His influence was isolated for the most part to the big city, and maybe the area outside of it. By contrast, by skipping town and avoiding certain areas, the gang were practically okay, and both the Vanderlyn gang and Bronte could technically coexist. Cornwall, on the other hand, had a level of power and influence that was backed up by a level of ruthlessness and possibly even arrogance and a feeling of invincibility that all knew no bounds. And the reason why I believe he was incredibly arrogant and invincible, money and status aside, just look at his first appearance on screen. Cornwall directly calls Dutch out by name, calls him trash, and basically threatens him, telling him to come out and die like a man. I mean, that's what I picked up on account of all the armed men. Given the reputation of Dutch Vanderlyn, a silver-tongued outlaw that's probably to blame for countless of deaths to just appear right there on the spot, is pretty bold. Cornwall's also directly funding the Pinkertons with a keen interest on the apprehension of Dutch an interest that never fades. We only really see Cornwall on screen twice, during this mission right here, where he technically confronts Dutch, and then the final time we see him during the mission paying a social call where he's concluding a meeting with Agent Milton himself on a private boat in the town of Annisburg, a town that is in Cornwall's pocket. He owns the entire coal mine, and this small town is all centered around working for and in, in around that coal mine, so naturally, by extension, Cornwall basically owns this entire town as well. It's kind of like a final reminder for us of how much influence and how powerful this guy really is. Not to mention, 
We do know, thanks to the chapter of Gormo, that he's even established business connections as far as that tropical island. So who really knows, globally speaking, the reach that he has? We know he has a hand in at least two rail companies, the Cornwall City Railway Company and the Southern and Eastern Railway. He's in charge of the Cornwall Company Freight Yard, the Cornwall Kerosene and Tar, and has a hand in the Jameson Mining and Coal Company, which is another piece that Beaver Hollow kind of shows us. Whether if he was out in Annisburg strictly to look for Dutch, which I don't really think so, I think Cornwall is the typical business mogul. He goes from where However, the next lucrative business venture is going to be, he's going to be there in person. And he was pushing to remove the Wapiti Native Americans from their land because there was supposedly some rich oil underneath them. I think it's because of that specific reason that he was in this general area and due to his many business ventures, it's just a reminder. He's going to be constantly on the move and if he's aware that Dutch is going to be in the area, he's going to be reminded of all the times Dutch and the Vanderland gang decided it was a wise choice to rob from him. And this is where it becomes that it'd be different if Cornwall was say the lackey or the right hand man of the business mogul, then you could just deal with the lackey and then that might be enough of a scare to push the mogul or the major businessman off to the side there would be no personal vendetta even if there was it would probably be too terrified to deal with it you know it's a distant problem i can recover the small amount of losses or at least in the grand scheme of things it's rather small a relatively insignificant amount but this also doesn't handle the Pinkertons and Cornwall's ties to them if Cornwall was killed and Milton wasn't I think that would just reinforce Milton's resolve and dedication to fine Dutch it would be a legendary blemish on his career if one of the agency's financers was killed under his watch specifically by the man he has been sent to deal with this entire time so if Cornwall was to be killed by extension Milton had to as well if Cornwall was spared and the gang just tried their best to disappear, let's say to the island of Tahiti for example, if it's an island with little tourism or business opportunities or wherever they end up, there was no possibility for Cornwall or any type of business to end up in that general area that they're hiding out in, then that would make the circumstances of them getting away no problem and would be a real possibility. However, Dutch's own affinity for killing and just enjoying the life of an outlaw, something he clearly loved towards the end of the game, I don't think disappearing and dying at an old age was ever on the table. At least after the death of Hosea, that all became a fantasy, a dream to keep dragging the rest of the Vanderlyn gang along into whatever scheme and plot he had around the corner. I'd also be a little ignorant if I left out how Dutch blames Cornwall for everything that has happened to the gang. So, what are we going to say to him that needs to be said? He has been hunting us since Valentine. He is the reason that Hosea got killed. His sugar business is destroying the people of Guarma. This town, Arthur, is his town. He bought it just to destroy these folks. His sugar, his oil, his law. These are wrongs that you can't write, Dutch. We're wanted men. Hmm. So why did you go for John against my wishes? I didn't want him hanged. Neither did I. We're gonna cut a deal, Arthur. What are you talking about? We want out, and Cornwall wants us to stop robbing him, and we all know his money is what's keeping the Pinkertons on our tail. He's America, Arthur, and I want out. And he, he won't let us go. This ain't making a lot of sense, Dutch. It will, son. It will. A deal, some noise, and then we're gone. He directly says he has it out for them. He's the reason behind Hosea's death and won't let them go. The whole deal proposition I think was a bluff. There's some elements to what Dutch says that's true, I basically just said the same thing. But at the same time, his argument of why he needs to go and goes on to describe all the ways his business and ways of doing things is destroying other people, to me it's just an echo and a shallower argument of what he repeated to Hosea before in terms of why Bronte needed to be dealt with. Only instead of a bank to hit in order for the gang to buy their freedom, now it's a shoddy deal that Dutch had to have known was going to be rejected in order to buy their freedom. Sir. Perhaps there is a plague on your house already, Mr. Cornwall. What do you want, sir? I'm not quite sure just yet. Your impudence will be your undoing, sir. I'm undone already. Even my best friend here, he thinks I'm crazy. 
And like this poor fellow you are talking to, my feelings are hurt. You robbed me, sir. And you robbed him. Funny world. You show a criminal's grasp of sophistry, sir. I did no such thing. You kill. I kill. You rob. I rob. Only difference I can see is I choose whom I kill and rob, and you destroy everything in your path. I've heard just about enough. I'll tell you what. You give me this ship, $10,000, and safe passage out of here, I'll let you live. <laughs> I'll do no such thing! <laughs> you sure? Good. I prefer it this way. You lost your man! Noise, Arthur! No voice! I don't think anyone would argue that the oh, whole deal was just a fragile attempt to justify shooting Cornwall. I think that was Dutch's intention all along. I think he's blamed Cornwall for everything, and similar to his feelings towards Bronte, I think that just stayed within him and continued to grow and become more and more passionate over time. And when Cornwall rejected his offer, he was way too, let's just say, eager to carry out what was probably his original plan. Let me know what you think. Do you think Cornwall had to have died? Do you think there was another way? Do you think I'm missing something, I'm totally wrong, or I'm onto something and there's a part or two that you disagree with? Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinion on this. But like always, my name is Cynic. Thank you so much for watching. And like usual, if you have any suggestions, recommendations, on what to cover, what to do next in terms of Red Dead Redemption 2 or any other games, please share that stuff down in the comment section. But like always, my name is Cynic. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Today I wanted to do something a little different and tackle a few topics all relating to Arthur's declining health, Dutch, and how Dutch may have possibly made a conscious decision that was further detrimental to Arthur's health and a little bit involving Micah. There's been something about Micah specifically that's been popping up more and more in my comment sections lately, so I just wanted to give my thoughts about that and squish the other two topics into one whole video. Of course, I could have made them into separate videos, but people love to binge these and I didn't think everything brought up here in this video or every conversational point that we're gonna be touching on was significant or had enough information to justify making them into their own videos without me running the risk of completely rambling, which I might still do. But with that said, I'd love to hear your take on these if they bring up some more questions or small pieces of speculation that has sparked up as this video goes on. Please share them down below as well as maybe suggest some other topics or ideas you had in the back of your mind you would love to have brought up into a video similar to this in the future. But let's start with what I would consider to be the least interesting of today's topics. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called... Hey Molly, where's Dutch? Well, however it goes. Micah being an Adriscoll. I've seen this mentioned a few times with the main reason as to why people are saying this is because of some little thing called the video game logic. Or I suppose it can make its way into the real world with gangs and proper representation based off colors or vests displaying allegiance to a particular organization. Here, in the world of Red Dead Redemption 2, one of the more prominent gangs, the O'Driscolls, are identified with the color green. The gang's members are often seen with green. Green shirts, green vests, green handkerchiefs. In Combs' case, a green necktie. Micah wears a green scarf. The color isn't exactly as vibrant or a direct representation of the Idrisco's chosen shade of green, but let's push that aside and humor this for just a second. While there is no concrete information on Micah having any sort of connection or affiliation with the Idrisco's, I feel it's important to point out Micah's absence in the Idrisco's assault on Shady Bell as another point of reference as to why he may be a plant. Throw on top of it the suspicious circumstances as to Arthur's kidnapping when Micah, the most temperamental and hot-headed member of the entire Vanderlyn gang, did something that was completely out of his character. He pushed Dutch to seek peace. Peace with someone that Micah, of all people, had to be aware that peace for Dutch was not a possibility. It's a giant red flag to us because obviously Micah's the first one to drop diplomacy and put a hole on anybody's head. After all, a bullet is far easier to replace than the money he's losing by bringing in extra for Dutch to 
Make up for the weaker members of the gang, that they aren't carrying their own weight. During Arthur's capture, Colm also admits to Arthur the whole point of the meeting was basically a setup. The plan was always to capture Arthur and use him as bait to have Dutch arrested and seized by the law. Admittedly, it was Pearson who actually set up the entire meeting, but it was Micah who actively pushed Dutch to meet with Colm. And it was possibly Micah who convinced Dutch to not worry when Arthur failed to meet them at the agreed rendezvous spot after said meeting. There was no rescue team or flare-up as to where Arthur was or why he failed to meet with Dutch and Micah. With no contact being made with anyone of the Vanderlyn gang following the meeting, you would think they'd be worried or preparing some type of search party, but that was far from the case. Who's to say Micah didn't play a hand in relieving Dutch's worry, giving Colm what he wanted? And see, that's where it gets a little difficult. I think from camp conversations, catching Micah stuck up to Dutch, and in the cutscene seeing Micah doing the exact same thing, just serving anything and everything Dutch wants on a silver platter, I don't think Micah ever had the intention of specifically betraying Dutch. I don't think he had an allegiance to Colm, in other words. I still think the meetup and Arthur's capture was serving Micah more than anything else. I think Arthur was an obstacle, and this was his way of just completely eliminating Arthur and removing him from the picture. Sure, the events surrounding Arthur's capture are incredibly suspicious, and nobody would fault you for raising an eyebrow at Micah and his affiliation to the Adriscals, but we also can't forget as Micah was there during both times in Coulter, he helped save Dutch from the Adriscals that took over the Adler Ranch. He was there when Dutch made the choice of raiding Combs camp and stealing his plans and explosives to rob Leviticus Cornwall's train. While Micah may not have been there during the assault on Shady Bell per se, he was still there during certain clashes and he is responsible for a number of Adriscals being killed, not only under Dutch's direction but even his own actions up in Strawberry that resulted in him being arrested and Arthur having to go save him, or even the subsequent mission with Micah where they go to rob a bank wagon and him and Arthur have to fight off scores of Adriscals. The only other thing I would say might lend a little credence to this is I still find it a little questionable as to how Micah came to be aware of Dutch and just miraculously bumped into him into a random bar and saved him. And then there's that bounty that he has of Dutch's name that's worth a thousand dollars. I still say that bounty predates the events of Red Dead Redemption 2 and we don't know too much about what Micah was up to leading up to the moment he ran into Dutch but I suppose it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that Micah had some affiliation to this gang and from them learned of Dutch and just by naturally seeing him in person or seeing how he spoke and what he stood for or how he conducted himself in that bar he just decided to switch sides and have allegiance to Dutch who really knows but I personally think he's not in a dress school and I still would say that him him being affiliated to them is a little bit of a stretch that if we there is country in Roanoke Ridge past Butcher Creek I believe we could hold okay you and Charles you can take folks up that way this one is interesting. Well, tuberculosis was a common reason for many deaths during this time period, with the belief that people could find their cure through drier climates. Roanoke Ridge, or the camp of Beaver Hollow that was located up in Roanoke Ridge, was the furthest place from ideal in terms of Arthur's advanced stage of tuberculosis. The camp of Beaver Hollow is placed in a rugged, mountainous area deep within the forest, right next to a stream. Let's assume the knowledge of ideal climate conditions is something that is universally known across the entire Vanderland gang, from Dutch to Arthur himself. And I think that's a fair assessment because during Arthur's diagnosis, he makes a comment about settling down further west in California, an area that would have been much better suited for the much needed rest that his body required. What do you mean? You're real sick. You. It's a progressive disease. And you'll be. Now, the best thing is rest and getting somewhere warm and dry and taking it easy. Now, is that possible? Sure, I can just take my winters in my country club in California. No, it's not possible. Now, like we did with Micah being in Driscoll, let's look at Dutch's decision to head towards Roanoke Ridge from two different directions. On the one hand, up in Roanoke Ridge, it's not too different from where they're at in Lakay Lake. Lakay Lake is hot and extremely humid. While it served as just a temporary meetup or safe house for the gang to regroup in wake of the failed Saint Denis bank robbery, Roanoke Ridge was meant to be much more, let's say, permanent. As Dutch says, it's an area they could hold out in. Keep in mind, this is just after they were ambushed by the Pinkertons here at Lake Lake, so 
they're pushed further east, something that they do every single time the Pinkertons catch up to them. And it pushes them more away from Dutch's long-standing dream of virgin lands out in the west. So on the one hand, it sounds like a good formidable position where the gang could continue to stay on the run and hopefully launch some operations that could secure them a little bit of money. The pattern of events and even the distance or the exact location isn't so foreign or out of the ordinary that it has anyone's ears perk. With the exception of Charles. As soon as Arthur tells him where they're headed to, he immediately mentions that being Murphy country, and is well aware of how dangerous the Murphy brood are, which is a group of people hiding out in the local woods that are more akin to serial killers than an actual gang, on account of their affinity for torturing and dismembering victims of theirs. Now, as we know, everything works out well for Arthur and Charles, with them easily clearing out the Murphys they run into, but it's a peculiar thought to think, what if this entire thing was a setup by Dutch? Dutch, over the course of the game, has shown that in certain circumstances, he's rather brash. He's quick to anger, and easy to forget those he once called sons. Right before Dutch sends Arthur out with Charles to clear out the land in Roanoke Ridge, Dutch is the victim of a harsh reality check. A reality check delivered by Arthur. We need more money. We've been on the run for months now, and I've seen you killing folk in cold blood like you always told me not to, and I'm sorry, but I can't help but think that if we there just- There is country in Roanoke Ridge past Butcher Creek, I believe we could hold. Okay. You and Charles, you can take folks up that way. Micah and I need to do some reconnaissance. It's one of the only moments where Arthur directly calls Dutch out on all his misdeeds and wrongdoings they, he's been committing lately, and it's a rather firm way that he does it, where he's holding him entirely accountable for it. Dutch becomes visibly upset and agitated, so much so he swiftly interrupts Arthur and tells him to move the gang out to Roanoke Ridge so he and Micah can do some reconnaissance. It's one of the earlier parts where it's very apparent that Micah is starting to replace Arthur a little bit more and it's one that Dutch may have had some well-informed intentions behind because keep in mind in subsequent missions that take place in Beaver Hollow Dutch actually calls Arthur out on being sick he makes fun of him he mocks him he cites it as the reason why Arthur doubts him he's delusional on account of his sickness one other thing I wanted to point out is how Dutch goes about trying to get rid of the family he sees as obstacles he appears to be unwilling to deal with them himself he leaves John to be captured in Saint-Denis. This is after John started to grow more and more disobedient, openly questioning Dutch and how real the dreams he's selling are. As we know, John became more and more doubtful of Dutch and even Hosea after Jack was kidnapped, beginning the decline of John and Dutch's relationship. Dutch let him get captured, or so it was claimed, and seemingly was content with John swinging for his crimes in Sisica Penitentiary. Dying alone or in custody was a fate he repeated for John at the end of the game, when he got shot off the train and Dutch and Micah claiming to save him instead just left him on the side of the train tracks. Arthur too was a victim of Dutch just walking out and leaving him to die, only to be saved by eagle flies. And because of that, it's actually quite plausible to say Dutch was agitated in this moment and thought, hey Arthur's on his way out, his health is declining. If the Murphy brood don't kill him now or anything else that happens in the future, then maybe this location can help expedite that process. He will no longer be an obstacle. I can do whatever I so please and don't have to worry about him anymore. Chiefs, wherever you is, there's Pinkertons and vice versa. So you better watch your goddamn mouth, boy! <laughs> or... <laughs> <laughs> Did Arthur attempt to infect Micah with tuberculosis? Low honor Arthur is a monster, completely different beast from regular or high honor. I mean, no matter how you slice it, Arthur as a whole is still a cold-blooded outlaw. I don't think leaning too much one way into his honor or the other makes the things he says or does out of character for him or reach a point that feels foreign or unnatural for him to say or do. But no, <laughs> there's never a point where I would see him intentionally infecting Micah with tuberculosis. Yes, Arthur appears to have a bottom line understanding of it and how people contract it. He's aware of how he got it from Thomas Down since he sources that as the moment where he got it to Sister Calderon. What's wrong? I'm, uh, uh, I'm dying, sister. Okay. Yeah, I got TB. I got it. Beating the man. To death. 
something for a few bucks. Blood was spat into Arthur's face and some landed in his mouth. While the ending of Red Dead Redemption 2 shows Arthur and Micah get up close and personal, with Arthur damn near clinging to life by the skin of his teeth and everything he's ever valued and cherished, even if that meant an honorable toe-to-toe, -to -toe, man to man type of fight, completely was thrown out the window. But in every single one of the four possible endings from good to bad, there's never a moment where he appears to spit in Micah's face, let alone do it intentionally. I mean, if you even think about it, it's a hell of a thought to fathom Rockstar would have the balls to have their protagonist, bad or evil, full on resort to biological warfare by an intentional intentionally infecting another person with, at that time, what would be considered a very terminal disease. And even if he did, let's play devil's advocate for a second. Let's say during one of the four endings, he did manage to get Micah sick. Unless Micah put his body through hell and stress and something as eventful as Gormo was on Arthur's body where he almost drowned and then got stranded on this island and stuck in the middle of a revolutionary war and then go back home struggling to regroup with the rest of the Vanderlyn gang, save John from Sisica Penitentiary, and then continue to be the glue that's essentially keeping not only Dutch's psyche together, but the Vanderlyn gang as a whole together. I think if it wasn't for Gorma, Arthur may well have still been healthy. The disease could have been dormant in his body for years, and the events of Beaver Hollow could have played out dramatically differently. Seeing how Mike is basically all for himself, I don't see even if he managed to contract tuberculosis via Arthur, I don't see there being a point where his body, his mind, and everything else he's being put through is so stressful and so taxing on his physical well-being that he's just going to hit the same point that Arthur ends up hitting. So even if Arthur did succeed and he did manage to spit in his face and Micah contracted the same disease that he's basically mocking Arthur for during the entire last chapter of the game, well, it would be a poetic justice I don't think it would even play out that way. Even if he did end up getting quote unquote sick or contracting this disease, I still don't think if we did see him during 1907 or during the epilogue the way that we do, I still don't think he would be that sick. He might be showing the early signs that Arthur was exhibiting, which could be nice knowing that a certain particular death is waiting for him around the corner. And you could say Arthur technically would have gotten his revenge that way. But let me know what you think. What do you think about these three topics? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Do you think they're kind of ridiculous and a little out there? I want to hear from you down in the comment section below. Like I said, just a little bit of a different video it seemed like an interesting topic. And I do want to apologize for how I sound. I'm not sick, but I keep fighting this cough. It's very similar to when I got COVID. It was the same type of cough, like an itch in the throat. So uh, I'm sorry if my voice sounds a little funny during this video. But anyways, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video. At this time, a countless number of videos have been made analyzing the personality and character of Dutch Vanderlyn. Most of it centers around breaking his true intentions down, whether if he was always the person he ended up becoming by the end of the game, or if over time he just gradually started to change. And this change being a cumulative results of Micah being in his ear, instigating the more volatile habits he was starting to display, a display of brutality and carelessness that was a result of constant stress and having to move from camp to camp desperately avoiding the law or having to deal with what he was seeing as increasing dissent from within his own ranks, most notably from Arthur, John, and even Hosea. Later during the events of Beaver Hollow, Arthur mentions Dutch may have always been like this, and even John later admits a similar sentiment towards Sadie. And he admits this during the epilogue when the two of them are riding to take care of a bounty that Sadie is heading. And it's while on this ride to try and recover an outlaw that was robbed off of her, the two of them start to talk about the gang in the old days. You heard anything of Dutch? Nothing. You? No. You'd think. He's a colorful character. Word would get out. That's one way of putting it. Look, what happened with the gang changed everyone who was a part of it. The Dutch who put a blanket around me after the O'Driscolls, that weren't the same man at Beaver Hollow. And now, he might not be so colorful no more. You see a man whose character changed. I see a man who got found out for who he truly was. We was fools to follow him. I was a fool and I paid for it. And I was one of the lucky ones. 
Naka, John. Naka's the one who set it off. I blame me for following Dutch for too long, but I blame Micah for most everything else. While the topic of Dutch always being the crazed lunatic we see towards the end of the game and starts to resemble more of the bloodthirsty outlaw that is more than willing to kill people for what he just calmly describes as doing it for sport. You and, and, and your friend there, the professor? We're gonna kill the both of you. Why you wanna do a thing like that? I don't know. Sport, I guess. Today we're going to tackle a little bit more of a complex issue, a little bit of a two-parter. That is, did Dutch somewhat redeem himself at the end of the game? Why did he shoot Micah and did this symbolize one good thing for the series of bad things that he's done? And I'm not referring to bad things that he's done to people outside of the gang. I'm referring to people that fell directly under his leadership, that he led to destruction, to death, to, in Strauss's case, possibly even torture. It's to a degree they were willing participants, it's not exactly like Dutch was holding them at gunpoint, at least not in the beginning, but throughout the entire game. Dutch is constantly hammering home that he has the power, he is the key to the future, to making it out of this life, to shaking the law, the Pinkertons, and any other stress and issues that they're going to be going through, they just have to invest all of their faith, all of their trust, all of their money, and ultimately all of their power within Dutch himself. From various conversations throughout the game, these people following Dutch all have their own stories, their own experiences, and first-hand accounts of witnessing Dutch be their savior. And slowly over time, it's not just a feeling of sticking to Dutch's side out of pure love and trust and believing in his philosophy and his vision for the world, how to live and how to conduct themselves, but it becomes a battle of something similar more to obligation. I think John's hesitancy to take Arthur's advice to take his wife and son and just run shows us that. Arthur. How you doing? Nervous, but I've been nervous for a while. I had a lot of time to think in that jail, and I feel like I just don't know Dutch no more. You ain't the only one. And this plan to get us out, it just feels... I don't know. Like he's stringing us along, I know. Killing in cold blood, revenge, we all do bad things, but he seems to enjoy it now. It's like he just wants to create more enemies, more chaos. Yeah, I know. I mean, I love Dutch. He saved me a long time ago. I feel like in San Denis, when I got arrested, maybe he could have done something. I feel like you should take your woman and child and get lost. Do you? What reason you got to stick around at this point? It's done. I don't see no way out of any of this. What about loyalty? That's long been broken. Obviously, this is just one specific example, but John trying to rationalize it, not just with Arthur, but even himself, I think is a good depiction of what lies at the core of everyone's problem here. And it's even an angle that Dutch abuses most of the game. What happened to all of you? What's with all of you doubting me? Don't you trust me? Have I led any of you wrong before? Well, he may be doing things or at the very least sharing ideas such as paying Leviticus Cornwall a visit or dealing with Cornwall Driscoll because he's always there to get them and they need to get him before he gets Dutch or any other members back first, or having to take care of Angelo Bronte because he won't let them live or escape because Dutch knows the type of man that he is and he's just someone that needs to be dealt with now rather than just let live. These are a series of things that Dutch continues to use to try and suppress any individual thought, any critical thinking. Dutch and every single member is constantly going from problem to problem and when someone wisens up to it, then Dutch reminds them everything that you've had everything that you are now, I've helped you. So can't you help me? Help me with this single problem and we can escape further west and hopefully land on this tropical island in Tahiti and live a life of leisure. I just need you to stick by my side just a little while longer. Just one more score, just one more take, just one more problem. And you'll no longer live a life of worry having to struggle or be afraid of the law or having to look over your shoulder terrified and a Driscoll will spot them or someone else will recognize them and that results in another fight leading to even more bloodshed. I think this is a very important thing to understand before we go down the road of answering if Dutch redeemed himself because everyone has this idea of Dutch. He was an adopted father. He's a savior. He's fighting for justice in an unjust world. 
He's a beacon of hope in a world that's slowly pushing them towards the flames of extinction. Their way of life, these quality of people, they have no place in civilization. Dutch began to slowly destroy that image and then by the sixth chapter was destroying it in an extremely grand scale. He was a polar opposite of what he once was, at least on the surface in front of all these people that believed he cared for them. Whether if Dutch was always this person or not, whether if it became a change in perception or it was just a series of mistakes that Dutch couldn't recover from and he just decided to give up. Even if he was always a bad man doing horrible things, the silver lining, at least in their eyes, was he was at least putting a code of conduct that seemed different than any other gangs were doing. And while it could be claimed that he manipulated Arthur and John who were children when he took them under his wing, in their eyes, he still saved them from a life that was probably much worse. Hosea possibly had more of a hand in that than we give him credit for, teaching the boys right from wrong and ensuring Dutch's more unsavory tendencies stayed in check as to not upset his right hand man, but it was still an image that stayed in everyone's mind. And as Dutch began to betray the person that they all seen him as, they all started to rationalize it by looking for other factors and sources to blame, most notably of which, Micah. Personally, I don't think the intent to go to Tahiti or really escape this life was an option for Dutch. If it ever was, he abandoned that a long time ago. He could have very well split up the gang members and used someone who's less likely to be known to have an affiliation with the gang to retrieve the money out in Blackwater or utilize the women better to rob certain opportunities. Hosea throughout the game was more for taking advantage of cons and tricking people that way. I think if you really break the story down, there might have been some key moments where they really could have escaped had that really been an option for Dutch. Whether if he was just addicted to the life of an outlaw or being the center of attention, having others rely on him the way that they did, always looking to him for guidance, wanting that position of power or just having people he saw as disposable, pawns that you can utilize to become this mythical outlaw. Whatever the reason, I believe at the end of the game we can see that ultimately Dutch is just out for himself now. He still claims that they're all family and Arthur and John are his sons despite him blatantly leaving them both to die on separate occasions. The concept of them being family and no one being left behind is just a shallow saying with the hope of evoking the emotions of past experiences, making it easier to forget the clear betrayal. Dutch! John? You left me! You left me to die! My boy. I didn't have a choice. John, I didn't... You! I didn't have a choice. You slapped me! I wish we got a little more insight as to how Dutch and Micah interact. We get some instances here and there in Clement's Point and Horseshoe Overlook where Micah's sucking up to him, telling him he's such a special man that he idolizes Dutch and even offers to go and retrieve the Blackwater money by himself. Don't get me wrong, they are important interactions that provide insight as to how Micah possibly slowly weaseled his way into Dutch's good graces in such a very short period of time, but these are interactions to provide us with the concrete information to definitively say that how Dutch ends up at the end of the game is how Dutch always was or if it genuinely was Micah pushing him in a direction that seemed easier. And I think that's another element to all of this because then it can provide more insight as to whether if Dutch was always like this or if it was something that just happened over time. But if you really want to cut it very black and white, from everybody else's perspective, there probably would be no redemption for Dutch. And that would be for two specific deaths that Dutch witnesses. Deaths of two members that were the pillars of the Vanderlyn gang. Two out of the four original founding members. And the first one is Miss Grimshaw. She outright gets shot by Micah for no reason other than Micah being challenged by her and siding with Arthur. Micah sees an opening and just outright guns her down, which Dutch witnesses. And he does nothing but just stand there. He doesn't question Micah, doesn't argue with him or reprimand him whatsoever for killing a woman who has been the center of the entire gang's camp upkeep. She was the one that kept everything running smoothly and, and making sure everyone was working. She's been here since day one and Micah guns her down in cold blood. Dutch doesn't even bat an eye. No betrayal, she didn't snitch, no breaking of loyalty whatsoever. There was just no reason to just leave it be like he did. Then we have the death of Arthur, Dutch's alleged son. The man that gave him his entire life. Even if we just go the route of the honorable ending where Micah doesn't completely kill Arthur, Dutch still chooses to ignore Arthur's pleas, to listen to him, to at the very least acknowledge that he might have been 
the rat the entire time. While he may walk off in a completely separate direction from Micah, he still lets Micah live. And that alone is damn near unforgivable. It's an outright betrayal of Arthur. And to go a little further, it's a betrayal of Miss Grimshaw, Hosea, and everything the gang ever claimed to stand for. Loyalty, being different, and not forgetting about each other, or just treating each other as a nameless gunman. No different than how Colm looks at his own disposable men. No sense of caring for their well-being or having any personal connection to these people. Their one and only purpose is to die for the glory of their leader. The entire concept of this being a family, while it was hanging by the hinges for quite some time, it was in this moment where it completely shattered. In Arthur's eyes and anyone else who would have witnessed Dutch walk away in this moment. Perhaps it was a reason why Dutch shot Micah years later on the hilltop. If it was just Micah, John, and Dutch, and Sadie had no part in it, or at least Dutch was completely unaware of her presence, I don't believe Dutch would have sided with John and took aim at Micah the way that he does. I believe he either would have sided with Micah or left them to it and walked away the same way he did when it came down to Micah and Arthur all the years ago, during the final moments of Arthur's life. I believe between here and when Arthur was pleading and begging for him to see all the damage Micah was responsible for, or at the bare minimum can be blamed for encouraging a plan of action that was never their way of doing things, perhaps it was in this moment staring down into the eyes of a dying Arthur, Dutch finally realized all the damage he was doing. Damaged those he once called a family. The acknowledgement of pain and disappointment in Dutch's face is unmistaken. Maybe deep down he was aware of everything he was doing and the path he was taking, losing sight of the fact that these are genuine people that he once upon a time may have genuinely cared for. With him finally getting the time to look into the eyes of a sick Arthur on his deathbed, something that he probably hasn't done in a very long time, just made everything surreal. It's easy to dispose of people or to paint them as the bad guys. Someone you could just cast off and convince yourself it's for the best. They aren't helping anymore or are now more of a problem than someone who has good intentions or and are looking out for your well-being. It wouldn't be too far-fetched to say this was a line of thought Dutch had subscribed to since he time and again said to Arthur he's always doubting him and, and he no longer has any faith in him. A sentiment that would only deepen upon the realization that Arthur was helping Reigns fall and the Wapitis in direct opposition to Dutch's plans. You help this fellow, Arthur? Please, what of it? What else you been doing behind Dutch's back? What? The wars are over. We have lost. These young men will be annihilated. Please. I'll see what I can do. Charles. Who else will come with me? Oh, I'll ride, Arthur. Who knows what other secrets I'll learn about. Say what you will, but ultimately, time and again, Arthur's own actions during Beaver Hollow was solidifying a sentiment that he was more of an obstacle. And with less time spent between the two of them, strengthening that perception, which was increased even more by Arthur's questioning the Dutch's plans and intentions every time they did work together, only causing more of a headache. However, hearing Arthur's pleas and this once terrifying gunman that helped Dutch take the world by storm face down in the dirt struggling to breathe, it humanized Arthur and helped Dutch remember everything he stood for at a time. While he decides to let Micah walk now, I believe Arthur's final message to Dutch of not being able to trust Micah finally got through to him. Whether if it was shame, embarrassment, guilt, the realization that he couldn't trust Micah, or the fact that the tattered legacy of loyalty, whatever remained of it within Dutch himself, was reignited and decided to walk away, to not venture off into the sunset with Micah. Come on, Dutch! Come on! Ah! It's a complicated issue from Dutch's point of view because, on the one hand, he may acknowledge his recent mistakes and wrongdoing, but the chance to recover from it is long gone. The gang is in a state of disarray with all the women and Jack long gone, removing any sense of some type of hope for the future. Arthur is practically dead. Dutch and Micah just chased John away as if that really meant anything. I think Dutch long made up his mind against John. Ultimately, Dutch had three choices, walk away, ride off with Micah, or kill Micah. With a price on his own head and the huge number of Pinkertons surrounding them, the distraction of Micah was something that he needed. While he may not escape with Micah, by his side at least he can count on not having to deal with an entire army of lawmen on just him and him alone. It may not be an actual step towards redemption, 
but by Dutch walking away from Micah, it's more of a leaving well enough alone type of response. There's no sense of betraying the legacy of his fallen comrades more by mingling with someone who very well may have been the source of the gang's entire misfortune by feeding the Pinkertons all the information. Dutch had to have known there was a rat no matter what. Micah was the one finally pinned as the source of the gang's misfortune, which hampered his plans for the future a little bit more because this is the guy that he's been planning everything out with. It's best to just drop the whole situation. It's a positive move to just move on. Now we don't know what Dutch gets into during the time between Beaver Hollow and the game's epilogue a few years later. There's practically no word of Dutch or Micah until the very end of the gang's epilogue. Micah's formed his own gang. He's become more violent and much more unpredictable and it's with the intention of killing him that John and Sadie accidentally run into Dutch, who claims he's here for the same reason as John. What are you doing here, Dutch? Same as you, I suppose. Dutch and I are teaming up once more. We got money, we got dreams. <laughs> Join us, John. You know, John's been shouting all kinds of things towards Micah as he guns down his men left and right. And the fact that John and Micah weren't exactly getting along the last time they were in Dutch's presence should make it clear enough that Dutch knows why John is here. To not exactly to team up or to recuperate any lost money from all those years ago. Or maybe in Dutch's mind, it might have been. After all, it's a little coincidental that all the money from Blackwater's here in this cabin and out of all the times John could have come to pay Micah a social call, it's the day that he and Dutch is in the cabin with all this lost cash. So I don't think Dutch ever came here to actually kill Micah. He may have been referring to the money or in his usual enigmatic self, he just kind of shrugged off John's question. I just say that clearly because I've seen that proposed before, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think Dutch came here to kill Micah. I think after some time of either trying to form his own gang from the ground up or maybe trying his own hand on living alone for some time, he just decided to go the easy way, returning to Micah and seeking him out and creating plans for a new future for the both of them. Micah's got the manpower and the resources and Dutch is getting older, he's got the wisdom, he still has that charisma, they can make it work this time, there's nothing holding them back after all. Things are different, as Micah says, it's a new century. With all the time passing in between the years of the Vanderlyn gang and Arthur's own death, I believe Dutch came back to give this whole partnership with Micah a second go, until John pays an unexpected visit and the memory of Arthur is brought up again. Let her go! Now I can't do that, John. Dutch! Dutch, come on now! You shot at me, son. You started! You betrayed me! I could say the same as you. I was trying to do my best. You? You just cared for yourself. I think differently. Join us! Join us, John! Let her go! She ain't well! I don't want to kill you, John. Arthur saved my life. More than once. Arthur's been dead a long time. This is a new century. Dutch. Dutch. We all did our best for you. Ain't our fault. Things turned out the way they did. Dutch. Killing me. Won't solve nothing! Put down your gun, Marston! Say something, Dutch! Say something! I ain't got too much to say no more. Dutch walks off and is visibly upset towards John. But facial expressions aside, this time in Arthur's death, 
are the only two moments where Dutch really has nothing left to say. Bringing Arthur's name up could have brought Dutch back to that night many years ago, or with his final breath, Arthur musters the strength to inform Dutch Mike is a rat. Feeling as if it was a lifetime ago, John summoning Arthur's name and the valiant effort Arthur made to spare him and his family to get them out of this life could very well have reminded Dutch that he can't escape his past, he can't escape the betrayal that he partook in for harboring a rat, for allowing so many people to die under his watch and do nothing. I think if it wasn't for John mentioning Arthur's name, taking him back, taking them all back to that time, I don't think Dutch would have turned on Micah. He almost had no reason to. If Arthur's name was buried in the past, so was everyone else's misdeeds, including Dutch's. I mentioned earlier that if it wasn't for Sadie being present, Dutch may have sided with Micah, but rethinking it now, I don't think Sadie being present or not was really all that important. I don't think it mattered, unless it was all about Dutch still saving face and he cared about being seen as a noble, charismatic person, and he valued Sadie's perception of him, then her being there or not, I don't think would have changed anything. Dutch didn't have the weight of having to carry on this facade, to wear this mask, to conduct himself and act in accordance with a law and a creed that he wanted those underneath him to operate within. He had nobody like that anymore, so he can do and say as he so pleased. All this time passing made him a different man with different circumstances. If it wasn't for Arthur's name coming up, I don't think Micah would have been the victim of a gunshot from Dutch. With that said, I don't think Dutch did it out of avenging his friend, his brother, his son. I believe he did it out of doing the right thing. Not morally. I think that's a different topic, but the right thing as in something that Micah had coming. The thing that he possibly wanted to do in front of Arthur all those years ago, but given the law's presence and other members still looking to him for leadership and the plans he already had with Micah and everyone else, those factors were no longer necessary to consider. It was as simple as, is Micah going to finally get what's coming to him, or am I going to spare him yet again? In Dutch's head, as he so likes to rationalize things and make himself appear to be so noble, I don't doubt he redeemed himself by betraying Micah. He may well have convinced himself that he avenged Arthur. But the reason for putting Micah down, I don't think it was a selfless act whatsoever, and I think Dutch leaving all that money behind was a repeat of what he did with Arthur. It's easier to just leave it be drop it all and walk away. From the outside perspective, there is no redemption for Dutch and all that he's done for betraying Miss Grimshaw, Arthur, the legacy of Hosea, and what the entire Vanderlyn gang stood for, for succumbing to reckless impulses and listening to someone that has only been riding with the gang for six months over the counsel of Hosea and even Arthur. In his own head, he may have redeemed himself to some degree by putting Micah down, but that doesn't allow him to shake all that he's done and how easy it was for him to just shrug off everything that happened to those that looked to him for guidance, for a way out of this horrible life. And he definitely didn't shoot Micah out of vengeance for Arthur, out of redemption for himself, for doing the right thing. I think it looked as if it was just a bunch of children fighting, arguing, and complaining, and in Dutch's head, it was much simpler to just shoot one and move on, with Micah being a much easier target. Because whether if Dutch wanted to accept it or admit it or not, John, Sadie, Charles, and everyone else that lived from the Vanderlyn gang will all attribute the downfall to Micah. Let me know what you think down in the comments section below. Do you agree with my take on this? What's your variation of it? Better yet, because I wanted to simplify it and use the honorable ending of Arthur's life. Some people don't like to accept whether if that is or isn't canon. So based off the different death that Arthur is given and of course Dutch's corresponding response and reaction to all of that, why do you think Dutch shot Micah? Do you think it was ever on the table that he would have actually put the gun to Sadie or John or maybe even both of them? Do you agree with me or do you have a completely different stance? Let's talk down in the comment section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your opinions, and your take on this. But like always, my name is Cynic. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video.